Good morning. Uh, before I get on with today's lecture, uh, let me uh, go over a few things which I had covered the last day. As I said, last day's ceramic membranes, they are used by wide range of technologies, food industries, uh, Uh, biotechnology industries, uh, pharmacological industries, textile, paper, petroleum industry, gas and a huge number of other materials, other in, uh, uh, industries. The first ceramic membranes came into the market uh, 1930s, 40s, which were mainly made of cellulose, but they did not work out because it, they degraded easily. The second generation of membranes came out uh, much later and these were based on polyacrylamides, polyacrylonitrile, polysulfones. These membranes could withstand higher temperatures, harsher conditions and, uh, and they are still being used largely as I showed you in many industries. Ceramic membranes first appeared in the market in 1980. Uh, it was made up of zirconia and it was macroporous. As I showed you yesterday, today we are using ceramic membranes even for gas separation. The reason is this that for example, in biotech industry, sterilization is very important. Uh, it is very easy to sterilize ceramic membranes since they can withstand very high temperatures and pressures. The big, biggest problem with ceramic membranes is their cost that is they are three to four times more expensive than the current polymeric membranes. However, this is compensated by their higher flow throughs. They can uh, a lot more materials can be transported and they are higher lifetimes. Now, having said this let me revert back to actual membrane manufacturing technology. Yesterday, I talked of ceramic membranes made up of alumina. When we are talking of porous ceramic membranes, the issue is we should have controlled porosity right through the body so that the pore sizes are uniform and rejection rate is uniform. Let me elaborate on it. For example, with alumina, it was basically prepared from a bohemite sol. It was prepared from a bohemite sol and these sols were stacked in the form of foams, clusters depending on who was working on them. So, this was the green unfired body made from the bohemite sol.
on firing to greater than 400 degrees centigrade this converted to gamma alumina and the structure was very simple because gamma alumina is platelet like the structure of the fired body was something like this because bohemite is gamma alumina is stacked in the form of planes uh, yes in the form of planes so these are the individual gamma alumina stacks and the way when they are fired these channels are opened up when they fire these channels are opened up now the size of the pores can be controlled by controlling the sizes of these channels this was a very simple technology which was developed uh, back in I think 1990s and uh, what we see is that if we make a plot that is the rejection rate this is a log scale this is 1 0 0.1 mm. over here mm. and the molecular weight also on a log scale ten thousand if I took this particular gamma alumina structure and then I fired it at say 400 degrees centigrade 500 degrees centigrade 600 degrees centigrade uh, and uh, 800 degrees centigrade then the molecular weight cutoff which is labeled as MWCO will look something like this It means that the gamma alumina which has been prepared at 400 degrees centigrade has finer pores. As we keep on increasing the sintering temperature, what happens? The molecular weight cutoff increases and this means that is uh, the pore size basically changes, the pore size increases because here at 400 degrees centigrade I can see that I can block low molecular weight fraction as I keep on firing to higher temperatures I can the MWCO cutoff increases to higher molecular weights in indicating that the pore size is increasing this happens because the grain size increases and if this sintering is done at 1000 degrees centigrade it changes over to alpha alumina and the ultra filter which we have over here changes over to a micro filter. Uh, 
this is one way in which alumina uh, ultra filters can be prepared. However, one of the things is here we have to look at uncontrolled grain growth. You see I talked of that our starting point was bohemite sol means ultra fine particle sizes maybe down to uh, 200 nm. It means that sintering will be rapid. Hence, uncontrolled grain growth may occur. And one way, or the only way to stop it is to add grain growth inhibitors. say 2 percent MGO. So, with this bohemite sol, we can prepare alt, uh, gamma alumina ultra filters, but controlling the porosity is a major, major headache. Ga to date, I do not know of any gamma alumina filter being in market. It is not simply available. It has been made in the research labs, but reproducible centering of the pores to have controlled pore size is not available. However, alpha alumina based microfilters are available which are used in standard water filters which you use. Another interesting material which is in the market is ceramic membrane filter which porous ceramic membrane filter which is in the market are titania membranes for ultra filtration. These titania membranes are made by starting from alkoxide root. That is they will take which is something that I the reaction I have used many times and this is condensation reaction. Now, here this ethoxide group is made to be very large. It is tertiary amyl alkoxide. It is used just to ensure Sol sizes are small. If you look back at my earlier lectures on alkoxide based synthesis, 
he will realize why use of tam tertiary amyl alkoxide will give smaller salt sizes. Now, this condensation reaction gives the zero gel, which is when dried gives you a porous body. If I look at MWCO molecular weight cutoff for a typical titania oxide based ultra filter, what I will see is It is very easy to design titanium ultra filters which can block say polyethylene glycol a uh, molecular 100 percent rejection of polyethylene glycol of molecular weight 200 I think it's this is 200 over here it just blocks it. So, these titania salts, these titania ultra, fil ultra, um, the, um, the ultra filters are first made by alkoxide based condensation reaction, then the zero gel is dried, the porous body is then fired at 300 degrees centigrade, uh, so that it becomes titanium ox dioxide and becomes rutile phase. and becomes rutile phase. This transformation to rutile phase occurs over a temperature 300 to 500 degrees centigrade in these alkoxide generated materials. Uh, other than this we have got zirconium membranes which are made similar to titanium membranes and in a short time I will go over to dense zirconia membranes, so I will bypass it. We also have composite membranes. Where we have got alumina silica, M most important one is zirconia silica. Here this is made by alkoxide based synthesis tetraethyl orthosilicate and zirconium isopropoxide hydrolyze condensation drying zero gel fire the mocw graph of this zirconia silica if i draw it it appears much more promising it, it is much more better than even titania though the advantage of titania is somewhere else.
this axis is the rejection axis and uh, I can have with this sort of zirconia silicate membranes a still shorter molecular weight cutoff. This using a particular commercial zirconia silica membrane, this is for alcohols sugars glycol this is the best available zirconia silicate porous membrane in all these cases one of the most important factors is porosity control yesterday i did tell you of my colleague's work dr prag vagreva who is now in iit bombay who initiated the work on porous ceramics in fact most of the porous ceramics work are based on using uh, powders starting powders are in the range of 0.7 to 1 micrometer and I showed you the reference where he used materials like egg white, uh, uh, the extract from a fruit which we call rite, I have forgotten the English name. Using those surfactants he fabricated these porous powders. The pore sizes were as large as a couple of millimeter and you can really look up Dr. Parag Bhargava's IIT Bombay. Department of Metallurgy. his website to see where is the latest state of art where he used these porous ceramics. I have been in our laboratory we have been working on porous ceramics and here our starting materials I will come to it this material weighs 1.5 grams material is magnesium aluminate with a density of 3.5 hence the volume of the powder you can easily imagine calculate back so what is the volume of the powder this powder has been sintered into this porous body which is about 1.5 inch in dia and about 0 0.2 inch thick. This whole body is just 1.5 gram with these dimensions. This material floats on water and it is magnesium aluminate. That is not where the most interesting part is. The most interesting part is what was the starting material. The starting material was 10 to 20 nanometer size unagglomerated magnesium aluminate. I will not go into the technical aspects and details because this is a technology we intend to commercialize. But I will give a brief, brief preview. This was 10 to 20 nanometer magnesium aluminate which was synthesized by a process we developed back in 1995 which was commercialized later in 1995. By this particular process we get nanopowders in the size range 
10 to 20 nm, 5 to 20 nm, and they can lie on the table even in the most humid condition without getting hydrolyzed. There's, these powders are that stable. These powders were suspended in water and surfact, certain surfactants, again I regret I cannot say what it is, but what we did was we suspended all this powder, these powders in water then added a surfactant so that a porous foam structure developed. This foam structure was fired at fifteen fifty degrees centigrade to obtain this particular product. If you listen very carefully, one of the best ways of knowing how hard a product is, is to listen to the sound as it falls. So, I will keep quiet, listen to the sound. It is giving off a metallic sound. This is a very well sintered material and the pore size we have seen by FESEM is in the range of 40 nanometers. I regret I cannot give any more details because this is a commercializing techno technology which will be commercialized. But this is where people are working over time. Today, having <coughs> porous membranes with nanometer size powders in the nanometer range is a technical challenge which people are racing to meet. <coughs> I have talked of porous ceramic membranes. What I would like to do is now bring in another different ball game <coughs> of dense ceramic membranes. Most of you now are hearing of hybrid cars, where the car runs on a hydrocarbon fuel and a battery. These cars have limited range of operations, 200 kilometers they have to be recharged. But there is now another option coming in as the hybrid cars which are already in the European market and will hit the Indian market very shortly is hybrid cars which uses SOFC solid oxide fuel cells. Essentially these solid oxide fuel cells produce electricity by burning hydrogen and oxygen. I will come to how SOFC, okay. let me whet your uh, curiosity. This is not what I wanted. Anyway, what I uh, before I remove this slide, if you look at this simply put in the skewed ceramic membrane design, you will see a huge variety of ceramic membranes. 
I am not free to show this slide because of intellectual property rights. However, if you Google image, Google ceramic membrane design, you will see the different types of ceramic membranes that are in use. Now, let me see what type of Ah, you can already see how many things are coming in. I just typed solid oxide. Here's a huge range of solid oxide fuel cells you can see over here. Again, since this is all copyrighted material, I am not free to discuss anyone individually. But what does a solid oxide fuel cell do? As I said, it is used to burn hydrogen and oxygen. Of course, at times, uh, water gas, carbon monoxide and water to form, to generate electricity. How does it do? First of all, we have, let me talk of this dense ceramic membranes. Uh, the oldest, best known one, as I said, is our solid oxide fuel cells. So, what does it look like? What I have is there and a dense impermeable. ceramic which is at the heart of the whole thing which is basically yttria stabilized zirconia. Yttria stabilized zirconia if heated above 800 degree centigrade, 600 degree centigrade and above becomes an electronic conductor. It has got a permeable porous porous cathode on one side and a permeable or a porous anode on the other side. This anode is basically made from cobalt, zirconium oxide or nickel zirconium oxide cermet while the cathode is strontium doped lanthanum manganate when the work first started all of them were platinum but now with the cost of platinum going up this is not the geometry of the real reactor would be this is the dense <coughs> ceramic. I would have the porous anode over here. The porous cathode over here. So, it would be a tube with coating of the anode and the cathode on the two sides. Now, how does the system really work? So, let me draw, redraw this diagram and try to explain it. So again, this is the dense impermeable ceramic body, which is made up of yttria stabilized zirconia. This is very dense. I have got <coughs> the porous 
or the permeable anode over here this is the anode and I have got the porous permeable cathode over here. Uh, I am drawing these channels merely as a representative of the interconnected pores in these anode and cathode. Is this anode and cathode? Air is pumped through this side. The whole thing is heated to 800 degrees centigrade. And uh, I can have either hydrogen or carbon monoxide plus water vapors flowing through this side. This is connected to a battery pack over here. So what happens is the electrons flow through here. On this surface they have got oxygen. Now, at this surface, the reaction occurs over here, half O2, this is a closure wing notation. Over here, what happens is then at this surface I have got O double minus. <coughs> due to uptake from the electron. This O minus drifts across. diffuses through the dense ceramic and over here at this end what happens is at this particular end this reaction occurs. The electrons flow back to the circuit. Here if I was using carbon monoxide or water vapor, the reaction would have been H2 plus CO2. We could in place of H2O or uh, CO plus H2, use methane plus water, whereby we could have now this circle circuit basically generates the electricity. And though I showed this, yet this is used as if I am powering it with a battery. What I can do in reverse is generate electricity and in this mode convert the greenhouse gases carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide, methane to hydrogen and CO and this CO can be converted again to hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Now the material to be used for this solid oxide fuel cell is really uh, constrained by compatibility, by stability at higher temperatures. 
and also the fact that these cells can should be able to withstand thermal cycling so if you look at google images uh, with solid oxide fuel cells you will see various designs there are tubular designs there are plate like designs of these fuel cells which are now coming into vogue if i simply google uh and i go to the wikipedia article because it's under creative commons and we can use it much more you will see a huge article there are a huge number of different types of fuel cells and they are being used for a huge number automobiles buses forklifts airplanes and you can see those diagrams down over here i hope i can, uh, they are there uh now. the basic is this is the way that how fuel cells work so if you look at this web page you will find there are various types of fuel cells which are used for various operations though let me say we very clear i have been talking of solid oxide fuel cells but the fuel cells which are being now used in cars in europe are basically based on this design of proton exchange membrane fuel cells and this is to a large extent if you blow this up uh you'll see that it uses polymer electrolytes pem this is not really strictly a solid oxide a, a ceramic fuel cell it is still an sofc but it is fundamentally a proton exchange electrolyte membrane fuel cells which is polymer based the reason that this come is this type of fuel cell design solid oxide fuel cells based on ceramics are yet to really get off from the drawing boards into civilian market they are being used in defense of space but solid oxide fuel cells are yet to come in in a large way in the civilian market the cars as i said are basically this proton exchange membrane fuel cell which uses polymers anyway uh so basically the thing is we the industry is driving to have solid oxide fuel cells due to a variety of reasons one is there is no electrolyte hence there is no corrosion because the operating temperatures are higher than 60 600 degrees centigrade with solid oxide fuel cells internal reforming can be done with solid oxide fuel cells in prototypes efficiencies of conversion of as high as 45 to 50% has been shown and more importantly and also with these solid oxide fuel cells the heat generated can be easily recycled <clears throat> other than these solid oxide fuel cells there are a wide 
variety of dense ceramics and uh, what I would say is instead of really expanding it more this is a good article this is a good article where they have discussed ceramic catalytic membranes for reactor technology. Uh, this is published in chemical chemist comments and here they have talked of reformation that is carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide, conversion of methane to <coughs> ethane, propane, uh, they have talked of conversion of uh, basically CH4 plus H2O to hydrogen plus CO and this CO being converted to CO2. There is a whole range of possibilities with these dense fuel cells. These dense, fuel, these dense materials are also ceramic membranes and so with <coughs> ceramic membranes we have either a porous ceramic membrane with very very well controlled pores during sintering of nano sized powders which are now coming in. Uh, it can be 100 percent dense membranes over which are like those used in solid oxide fuel cells. I have talked of yttria stabilized zirconia, but then if you <coughs> look up perovskites are being increasingly used as dense fuel cell material for proton exchange. It is simply beyond the scope of this course to cover all of this. However, if you would care to look up to sh the reprint which I showed you, it would expand your horizon.